Hello and welcome back to Division One Rejects. I'm your host, Kobe Manzo, on the night of Thursday, September 5th. A lot of great football happening tonight. Uh, unfortunately, it's already 1130 where I'm at right now. All these games are wrapping up, trying to get things posted out on the socials for y'all. I will not be covering all the Thursday night. A lot of D2 games, some NAIA stuff, even a D3 opener with uh, lacrosse. I will not be covering those games in uh, tonight or today's episode as you're listening to this on Friday, tomorrow morning. Um, Those will be in next week's first episode of the week, so that episode that comes out on Tuesday, so look forward to that. But uh, does not mean we don't have a great episode coming for you uh, tonight. I've got not one, not two, but three incredible guests on tonight's episode. We'll lead things off with the quarterback from the University of Wisconsin, River Falls. Leading up the Falcons, it's Caleb Blaha to start things off here. He's followed by a very talented linebacker out of Texas Wesleyan in Ashali Cannon. And then we'll close things out with a linebacker at the D2 level out of UTPB and Tristan X-Line. So really excited to talk to each of those guys. River Falls, big-time matchup against number 7, I believe, Alma this weekend. Texas Wesleyan is coming off a win against top 20-ranked Lindsey Wilson. Also their first win under new head coach Brad Sherrod. And then UTPB. This weekend, first Colorado State Pueblo, that is going to be one of the best matchups inside of Division II football. We'll talk about that later. Now, if you remember in the episode earlier this week, Jimmy Martin and I went through some of the best D3 matchups previewing this weekend. So we won't be talking about a lot about the D3 football slate this weekend. Matt Schwarzler and I also went over the NAIA slate. Tonight's going to be me looking at a lot of the D2 games. I'll say a lot, but four or five. We'll try and highlight four of the five of the best D2 football games coming up this weekend. So the game's on Saturday. Um, but other than that, like I said, get the three great guests, so be sure to stick around for them. Don't forget, if you're watching this on YouTube, get the video chapters bottom of the screen right there. Fast forward any part of the conversation you want to check out and then get the hell out of here. But for those of you listening, I really do appreciate you. Exciting that football is back, and I uh, I am definitely here for it. Let's get to that first guest conversation with Caleb. Join the show tonight. The man many believe will be the WIAC Offensive Player of the Year. He leads the Falcons offense at UW River Falls. Quarterback, Caleb Blaha. What's up, man? How's it going? It's pretty good, man. Really good. I, t- I told you before we got going, I don't know why the hell we've never had you on this show. Uh, long overdue, but the fact that we have you here, here and now is all that matters. I'm excited to get you on here, and, and what better time in front of uh, a really great matchup this weekend, dude. So just excited, in short. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Hell yeah, man. Absolutely. Now, uh, this team, right I would imagine right now, not that they need a ton of motivation, right? Game one is is a pretty easy thing to get excited for. Probably pretty easy to get these boys dialed up and uh, go on the road, try and pull off an upset against a top 10 team in the country. Yeah, I mean, we're super excited. I mean, felt like it's been forever since the last time we played football. But yeah, we're really looking forward to it. Should be a big game, big matchup. But yeah, we're pumped over here. I like that. And actually, I had, oh, hold on, I had to. And grab something. Sorry. What is I just, that? I just had to. Uh, oh I, no! I I just had to. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, brother. No, hey. No, no, no. I I have no horse in this race. I have no horse in this race. But um, I had to. I mean, I'd be remiss if I did not pull that one out, brother. Um, um, I might have to leave this call. <laughs> you know, you got you guys throw a helmet my way, man. I'm a sucker for a for a nice helmet. But no, I'm I'm excited about this matchup. Uh, you guys, let's talk about you, right? Let's talk about you and, and your squad over there. You bring back more than half your starting offense, right, and almost your entire defense. And it's something that Alma certainly cannot say. We'll talk about that later. And there are some of their changing of the guard over there. All three of your losses last year to top-level conference foes, one score affairs, my man. It felt like, from an outside perspective, I'm sure it probably felt the same way for y'all, this close to really breaking through and seeing all that potential. Is this the year the Falcons are able to do that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think it's the past two years, every loss we've had has been less than a, a score or less. So they've been an all super close. But, I mean, yeah, like you said, we return a bunch of starters, and I think that's, going to be a big key to success as we've been playing together for a long time we know like how it feels to lose and how to be so close and yeah we got a big senior class so 
we're hoping this can be the year we break through. I like that. I like that a lot. And uh, you guys spread the rock around a lot last year. That's something that I can certainly appreciate. And I know you won't say it. I will. The offense runs through you in the air, on the ground. I mean, you do it all for them. Uh, And you're a big part, a massive part of that success. But like I said, what I love about it is – you had nine guys with more than 10 catches last year. That's no small feat. When you spread the rock out like that, you get a lot of different guys incorporated on the offensive side of the ball. Quite a few splitting the load in the backfield at the running back kind of position. Do you feel like depth is a strong suit and a calling card of this team this year? Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, we have so many playmakers and very good players that we can get the ball to. I mean, it helps me a lot. You don't really know where the ball is going because every anybody can make a play at any moment. And... Yeah, it just helps a lot. Good answer. Good answer. Now, do you believe you'll have any guys in particular grow into larger roles this year than you've seen already? Um, yeah, I think there's a few guys who um, are looking to have a big season who haven't like really played for us a ton in the past. But, I mean, we also return people who have put up a ton of production. So I think it'll be a little bit of both. But, yeah. No, I get that. I get that 100%. And that's you know that's something, too, that there's a, it's a good problem to have when there's a lot of guys that can go out and produce, right? Because you're spreading it around, and, and sometimes people make the argument, well, maybe they don't have the guy to go to at the down and the stop. But uh, the answer I would probably give them is the guy is, is getting the ball every single play, that being you under center or in the shotgun. Um, well, then again, you, you let me say that. Obviously, you ain't going to talk about yourself like that. But uh, you guys opened up last year, though. Kind of, I'm assuming this feels maybe a little deja vu Last year, massive win over a top drank opponent any similar feeling heading into 2024 or totally different circumstances oh yeah i mean it's it's kind of the same feeling just a huge opponent opponent week one um i don't know we kind of look at every game the same so we just got to go out there and play our best nameless faceless opponents you guys ever talk about that yeah a little bit is that you buy into that, or is that a load of shit, right? I mean, sometimes sometimes you look at the dudes like, that's a dude. Like, we got a game plan for the dude, and uh, we know about him. Like, there's got to be some guys you line up against that you're like, yeah, we know all about you, pal, and I, I've been watching you for a while. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, you're going to have different feelings for different teams. We play different people, but you just got to play play our football, and that's what we do. You're doing a really good job of deflecting. I can appreciate that. This see, my job is to prep you for the people, the assholes that give you like the real tough, like get you in a buying type of questions. And you're gonna be you're gonna be prepared. But um, Alma, though, to talk about the other side of the ball just a little bit, they're in a unique position where they graduated. I mean, basically, if not the entire the entirety of their defense, right? All seniors that move on. And from your perspective, does that actually make it any more difficult when you're going through game prep and studying film because all of those guys have since moved on and you don't have new tape of those guys? Or are you more so focused on the system and how you guys scheme against that? Um, I think it does make a little difference. Um, I imagine they'll be running a little bit of the same stuff. So we kind of just like see what they run or whatever. And it's we don't plan too much based off of individual players and how they play or what they do. But, yeah. I feel that. What do people need to know about this uh, 24 Falcon squad, man, that they don't already? Um, I'd say, I don't know, we're ready to, to make that big jump. I think we got a lot of people uh, here ready to win some big games, and we have the right cast to do it. So, yeah, expect a big year for us. No, I agree wholeheartedly. Do you feel like you guys have been given the respect that you uh, maybe think you've earned this offseason, or is that yet to be earned and go out and take that? I guess not even earned. you got to go take that at some point. I think, yeah, we're we're sitting good right now. I think um, we don't want to be ranked up too high and have everyone saying we're going to go win this whole thing. We like being the underdogs a little bit, and, yeah, we want to go take it. Isn't that kind of a funny thing where oh, you, obviously you'd love some people to believe in you, but sometimes it's like, okay, not so much. Like, need some of you guys to, like, jump off the wagon and go root for somebody else because that's fuel to the fire? Or is there, like, a, a, weird, a weird in-between almost where um, obviously you'd love to have people in your corner, but at some point it's like, I like being the underdog, man. I like going in and having nothing to lose and, and having to scrap and go get some of these wins. Yeah, exactly. I mean, we like having the fan base, having supporters with us, but we – um, Something about being counted out. 
Yeah, exactly. We just yeah. we like the fire of uh, people doubting us and having something to prove, and that's going to help us. Where do you think your your game takes the biggest step this year? Me individually or as a team? You individually, brother. You know, eventually I was going to ask you about you. <laughs> um, I don't know. Biggest thing for me is I just want to win games, so hopefully be the difference maker to push us over the edge. But I think something I can prove on myself is taking better care of the ball and okay. uh, doing a better job of having less turnovers. Textbook textbook brother i'm excited man if you can't tell i'm pumped um i will not be wearing the helmet on saturday i'll be locked in probably on my sofa no apparel of either side anywhere near me but i'm just excited for good football as a fan of good football i'm excited to watch good football on saturday also really appreciate you coming on the show spending some time with me man yeah i mean if you want to wear that that football helmet like i said we like our we like our doubters Helps fuel our fire, so we're ready to so, go. Yeah, maybe, maybe you want me in the helmet. Send out a little pregame tweet. You got the fellas in the locker room ready. Look at what this jackass did. Get them going. <laughs> exactly. I'll show all of them. Get them going. No, but really, man, I, I'm I'm very excited to see this game this game this weekend. But just to follow these two teams um, individually, obviously, I've gotten the chance to to get to know the Alma people pretty closely over this last uh, year. I mean, they recruited me out of high school. I got great relationships with them. But I know there's great people on your side of the ball as well. And and you guys have been a fun brand of football to watch. So I'm ready. I'm ready for it. I know you are. Thank you for joining me tonight. And have a good rest of your night, Caleb. Yeah, thank you for having me again. I really appreciate it. Of course. See you, brother. Also joining the show tonight, big part of the defensive effort that led the Rams to victory this past week from Texas Wesleyan, Shally Cannon. What's up, man? What's up? How you doing? Man, excited to get you on here. I was telling you before, I uh, your first Ram we've had on the show, which is uh, bad, maybe a little bit of a badge of honor in itself, but uh, I've seen your name on Twitter too many times to not get you on the show. And after looking at the box score, looking at what you guys have done, and also talking about your coach in a pretty recent episode, I think... Stars aligned on this one. I'm excited to get you on here, dude. Yeah, thank you. I'm I'm grateful and I'm glad to be on here. Absolutely, man. You and you and me both. Now, what a start to uh, 2024 for you and the guys down there. Number 20 team in the country. They come into your house. Yeah. They leave 0 and 1. That's a pretty good way to start things off. Talk to me about the reactions from that one. Yeah, definitely. Um, we've been preparing the whole summer, the the whole summer since June. I've been in here in Texas. I'm from Maryland. So okay. I've been here in Texas since June preparing for these guys. We knew they was going to come in. They was going to play hard. They're a playoff team. They know what it takes to win, and we knew it was going to be a fight, and we was prepared for that. It looks like it, for sure. It definitely does. Now, you're from Maryland. You come in there. Uh, when did you report? I guess not report is not the right word because it's not mandated. But when did you get there and start, uh, you know, getting to work with the guys and those kind of things? Dude, I think I got here around – June, I want to say like June 10th. That's good. Around there, yeah. So, you know, me and the guys in the defense, we've been working and, you know, we're pretty close. So we know what it takes to win and how to communicate and compete. Yeah, and that's that's uncommon for for this level of football, right? You don't see guys that that typically you have a good group of guys there in June. There's a lot of teams at the lower levels, the D2, NAIA, D3 kind of levels that uh, will try and get guys back up in July. But even then, yeah. it, it sometimes is tough for them to to make sure because obviously with yeah. that, guys got to got housing. Well, a lot of times right. dudes need to find jobs outside of that to you know make a little bit of money on the side or um, right. might have people they need to take care of or those kind of things. So the fact that you guys can have a, a good core group, it sounds like there and, and working, the buy-in from uh, a good amount of the guys felt like it was pretty yeah. good this summer. Yeah, definitely, definitely. That's I think that's the biggest asset we have as a defense is that the whole defense is bought in. We're all bought in 100%. I like that. Now, that game was tied up. I mean, it was 24-24 at the half, right? You finished 34-24, right. shut out. You pitched one in the second half. Whatever the hell kind of adjustments you guys made in that locker room at halftime, I mean, spill, but I'm trying to – what did you guys do at half? Was there any kind of change of game plan? Because you came out with, I mean, some kind of different mindset, and it worked. I mean, it wasn't any real adjustments besides stop the run. Okay. Because they're, okay. they're a good run team, and it was running the ball – all first half and we just said we had to you know we had to stop that run and make them one dimensional yeah that's a that's a good way to go about it and uh it's one thing to say it 
It's an entirely other thing to go and do it, which you guys were obviously able to do. Now, it was also the first win for the new head coach down there, Coach Rod, who uh, we've yeah. talked about on a little bit recently on the episode. What has it been like so far with him leading the charge now, and how have uh, him and the staff prepared you guys for this kind of uh, national stage, I guess? Oh, I love it. Um, shout out to Coach Rod. You know, as you know, he comes from all types of D1s and that type of level, and what he told us, he don't expect anything less from us just because we're NAIA. He expect he asks us to do the same thing. He asks his players at Wake Forest, at UTSA, at any place he coached. So I think holding us accountable to that standard really helped us, you know, move forward and get this win. I like that a lot. That's that's uh that's interesting because I think from his perspective too, that's that's showing trust in you guys, right? And the fact mm -hmm. that like hey, these guys might have more things, you know, available to them, whatever, the resources, whatever. But, you know, I'm trusting that you guys are going to get your part done, whether that's uh, on the field, in the classroom, in the weight room, in the training, whatever those things are. You come in and handle yourself like a professional, and he's giving you uh, kind of a little bit of that leeway to make sure, you know, and, and trusting you guys to do, to do your part. Is that what it sounds like? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And then our defensive coordinator, Coach Houston, um, he's been a big role in that, just letting us have energy, if you see him on the sideline, he's celebrating just with us. So having that energy and having that com uh, camaraderie, just allowing us to bond and be great together. Need that. Need at least one of those coaches that just uh, has a, just the right amount of screws loose on game yeah. day. Um, yeah. and you know exactly what I'm saying, right? There's yeah. there's guys that are missing too many, and there's guys that <laughs> need to knock a few more out. But there's a couple, yeah. man, that, that got just the right amount holding it in place and just enough where they're, they get going when, uh, you know, Saturday or – Thursday, I guess, in this case, uh, comes around. But obviously, Coach Arad, he's just taken over this team. But the guys that have been on this roster, they've experienced a lot of success. 8-2 and in 23, 9-2 in 2022. This isn't a program he's had to quote-unquote resurrect, but how has he started to build on that and get all the guys new and old uh, rowing in the same direction, so to speak? Um, the big key we've been targeting on this year is we don't care what we did last year or the year before that. It doesn't matter because at the end of the day, we want to be a playoff contending team. And not just that, we want to compete for the national title. So anything under that, that's we're not going to accept. So we have a standard. That's how you got to approach it. You have to. And when you set those kind of, uh, you know, you, those goals and those type of aspirations, then you got to have the work ethic and the other things that come with that yeah. to, uh, you know, to equal that out. And I'm sure that you guys are working towards that. Now, it is crazy to think this program, has already had that level of success. I rattle off some of the records from recent years, and you guys are certainly, there's a lot of ball to be played, but you guys are certainly on pace to go through and have a lot of success this year as well. This program, in less than a decade after being revived from, was almost a 75-year hiatus of no football down there at Texas Wesleyan. The school brought it back in 2017, 2016, 2017, around that time, and and this is a program that is already back on the national stage. I mean, that in itself is, uh, is a pretty impressive thing, but uh, the confidence level down there from you guys has to be I say it at an all-time high, but obviously, you know, there's a, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. I'm sure you guys are on the right side yeah. of that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, with the program coming back, you know, I wasn't obviously here when the program got shut down or yep. when we did start rebuilding, but as our old head coach, Coach P, he used to tell us about how they really had to build. They really had to build, and we came a long way in the group of people. I feel like we're, we're here to – from them guys that, that couldn't make it or couldn't get it through, we're here to complete that journey and be successful. That's neat. And that's something that I think a lot of coaches talk about and will give credit to, but it's cool to hear a player in your shoes talk about it because obviously there were guys in those first couple of years where, I mean, his face it, shit was not looking yeah. how it is now. Uh, those yeah. guys are bricklayers, right? Those first couple of classes, those guys are bricklayers. Yeah. And, and the thing about being a bricklayer, especially in that kind of position, is that you're not – typically going to be around long enough in the sense of playing. Obviously, they're you know hopefully right. all still with us. I mean, let's not get more right. here. But um, <laughs> you're not typically going to be around enough or around long enough, I should say, to see what you're building, to see the bricks that you're laying come to fruition. So it is cool for a guy in your shoes to recognize that, and I think that happens with a lot of the great programs. Um, but to show some recognition to those guys is really neat. Now, yeah. let's talk about you a little bit. My man, 14 tackles for you on the night. That's awesome. That's an impressive stat alone. Still a lot of ball to play, but you're obviously feeling very comfortable in this system, or at least I would guess looking at that stat line and uh, having success in that. Why is that? How does this system set you up to fly around and chase down the ball carrier? 
Um, just to start with my big boys up front, the D line. Hell yeah. We have a we have a great D line. They know how to get off the ball. They know how to shed blocks, and they make our job as linebackers a lot easier. And also coaching my coach, Coach Roses, and Coach Houston, and Coach Sherrod, they all have helped me to become a better linebacker. Even though you know we think we're good, and you know um, we have athletes on all sides of the ball where it comes to the cornerbacks, the safeties, the D line. But just the little stuff, the technique, it always comes down to little stuff, just perfecting that. I think that's what helps us when it comes game time. I like it. Now, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about this weekend, man. You got Ottawa, Arizona on the road Saturday. What have you seen yep. from the spirit? What do you need to prep for? Yeah. So we got to wake up early in the morning, get on that plane, you know, get our minds right. Big time. It's a two-hour time difference, a lot of adversity. We're going to their home. So it's just, you know, staying focused, having that uh, laser focus and just, you know, want to know. That's all we're focused on this week is going want to know. It don't matter what we did last week or what we did to them last year. It just it's a new year. They don't have, you know, it's a new year. So we just excited to go down there, play and stay focused. Textbook answer, by the way. Textbook, absolutely. I, I'd imagine a part of that, yes, it is absolutely adversity. Having to get on a plane, having to deal with the time difference, having to do all these things that are kind of outside of your control. That Those are tough. Is there another smaller part of you that's like, this is awesome? This is like a big time, like a road oh. trip, get on a plane, oh. go over, do the oh, thing. Sure. We're playing football. Talk about that, like that process. And yes, it's obviously adversity, but at the same time, man, the fact that football enables uh, guys like you and me to have these kind of experiences, pretty damn cool in itself. Yeah, for sure. Like, I have never been to Arizona in my life, so I'm excited to go down there. And I heard their environment's crazy, so I can't wait. And like you said, playing football is just a fun sport. It's a fun thing to do. So no matter who we're playing or where we're playing at, we're just going to have fun and do what we do best. You're the man. I'm excited, man. I'm excited to tune in with you guys. I uh, admittedly have not been hip to this Texas Wesleyan squad. That changes today. I'm definitely locked in and trying to follow you guys along with you um, this year, especially you in particular. But, uh, Ashaya, that's all I got for you, brother. I appreciate your time tonight, my man. Thank you. I'm so grateful, and thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. Have a good rest of your night, man. See ya. You too. D2 Week 1 preview. Obviously, we've done a lot of coverage about the Week 0 slate. But now moving into Week 1, we've got a couple matchups that I definitely do want to highlight heading into the weekend. The first of which... We've got the New Haven Chargers, who are receiving votes in the national poll, at number 11, Slippery Rock. And uh, quick notes on both these teams for those of you maybe not as familiar. Slippery Rock, they won their first 10 games of the season in 2023, finished the year 12-2, and and then won the PSAC West title, also made it to the playoffs for the fifth straight year. They made it to the quarterfinals in the playoffs for the third time in the last five years. That is incredible. And... Um, then on the New Haven side of things in 2023, 8-3 overall, still a very respectable record. They did end up winning their conference, the Northeast 10. That conference title, they put together a 6-1 and record in conference play. Also reached the playoffs for the third straight season for the Chargers. And then uh, they lost in the opening round 52-44 at uh, University of Charleston. So um, a lot of success from both these squads. And... Right off the rip, like Slippery Rock is the heavy favorite in this one. I think I would be, I, I would be lying to you if I said I think New Haven's going to win this game. It doesn't mean I don't think it's going to be a competitive game. Uh, Slippery Rock is definitely the favorite. They have had 14 straight season opening wins, and they've not lost a home opener since the year 2005. That's almost 20 years ago. That's incredible. Also going in their favor, Slippery Rock has 17 starters returning. But out of the couple, not four of them were starting O-linemen, all of which had earned all PSAC honors for the Rock down there. So most of your starters are coming back, but one position apparently was absolutely decimated to graduation or just losing those guys. So that's definitely going to be an interesting spot for them. The other big piece they lost last year, we'll talk about Kyle Sheets here uh, in, in a second, but the wide receiver tandem, that duo, Kyle Sheets, Cohen Russell, they were the only duo of wide receivers um, in uh, D2 football last year, to, I believe, to have over, I think it was 1,100 yards apiece. And Kyle Sheets, who just spent his summer with the Kansas City Chiefs, this dude is an absolute Dog. These are some of the highlights last year from Sheets this time with The Rock. And uh, another big piece, the guy throwing him the ball, Brayden Long, 
He's back under center. 3,800 yards, 35 touchdowns, only six interceptions in 2023. You see him right there, number 18, throwing absolute dots to that massive target, Kyle Sheets, down the field. Now, missing Kyle Sheets, that's going to be a huge part of their offense, no doubt. Him and Cone Russell combined for a lot of big-time pieces. But they do bring in, excuse me, some pretty talented transfers in the offensive skill positions. The first of which, Idris Lawrence. He's a running back from Notre Dame, Ohio, and... Uh, you know, what's interesting about that, obviously, for those of you that are semi-tapped in with the D2 football or small school football world, you know that Notre Dame, Ohio, actually, unfortunately, closed its doors. The school itself uh, no longer has any students. Uh, here's some of his clips from the last season. And sorry about the resolution on these, but it's all I could get off the YouTube. Anyways, over 3,000 rushing yards in this guy's career. He's 5'10", 190 pounds. He was an All-American last year for the Falcons. And that Notre Dame football team was a really solid squad. So Idris Lawrence is going to be a big-time pickup for this Slippery Rock offense. You also bring in Rashawn Harvey, the wide receiver from West Liberty. He led the team in receiving yards there. Seems like there would be a naturally kind of a hole and a role for him to fill on this Slippery Rock offense coming at the wide receiver positions. So there's going to be opportunities available for those offensive skill guys. So definitely smart. It looks like Slippery Rock has gone out of their way done their due diligence Excuse me, to fill in some of those holes. They also have brought in, I do believe, multiple offensive linemen from the transfer portal that will be competing for that uh, those couple of vacancies up front. We talked about it, man. Four offensive linemen from your starting five last year no longer with the squad. That's going to be a tough thing to overcome. I'm still taking Slippery Rock by two scores in this one at least. Uh, I think the offense is just going to – it will be more than enough. Their defense, we don't talk about enough on this show, but they do just fine for themselves on the other side of the ball as well. Now, moving over. Number 24, Angelo State at Emporia State, who also is receiving votes in – in the national poll. Emporia, they're coming off a 30-14 to win versus Ashburn. And Angelo State is coming off a 21-7 to win over Fort Hayes State. Angelo State, a little bit of a uh, quote-unquote probably down year for the, uh, for the Rams last year. And uh, you look at their record. 7-3, and three, which again, quote, that's why I said quote-unquote down year because this team has been one that we've come to expect a lot of success out of. Their losses last year all to really respectable opponents. Colorado School of Mines, Central Washington, a, a big-time playoff team, UT Permian Basin, all of these two, uh, almost all of them, one-score losses. So expect them to be back, but uh, not getting off on the right foot this year. Like I said, versus Fort Hayes State, they dropped that one 7-21. to 21 on the road to a Fort Hayes State team that is, you know, for being honest, on the bottom third of the MIAA when it all comes, you know, when it all shakes out. Um, Angelo State-wise, they had no success uh, really on offense, but passing the ball especially. Uh, Caden Smith, their starter, he was 9 for 13. He was efficient, but only had 75 yards and uh, no touchdowns on the day. Braden Fuller also took some snaps under center for them, was 8 for 11 for 48 yards. Just not seeing a whole lot of production out of the air right now for Angelo State, and I think their calling card for the last couple of years when it comes to the Rams has been their defensive secondary. They've had one of the best pass defenses in the country, statistically speaking, and Early indications show maybe that's not the case anymore. Jack Dawson from Fort Hayes State, he had 270 yards and two touchdowns against them through the air. Did have an interception, so they got a takeaway. They generated one there, but it, it looks like the calling card for Angelo State might not be as potent, potentially, as it once was. Uh, Emporia, on the other hand, really did not have uh, too many problems offensively, especially when it comes through the air. Gunner Gundy, which... He's coming over from Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, excuse me, playing for his father, Mike Gundy. He comes over to Emporia. He's now the signal caller for the Hornets over here. 27 for 41 in his debut, 292 yards and three touchdowns. One interception to go with that. He also rushes 11 times for 100 yards on the ground, and uh, that's a pretty good debut for Mr. Gundy under center. ESU, they go from Braden Gleason, who was a, you know, kind of a Harlan Hill hopeful and someone who made a lot of things happen for the Hornets. Looks like they have potentially the next guy to step up, fill that role under center for them. And I think that's going to be kind of the name of the game. I don't see Angelo State's offense based on just what we've seen so far in, uh, in week zero from them. I don't see them able to keep up with the Hornets. And we know they've got a Hornets have a pretty good track record of, uh, you know, winning some of those shootout type of contests, at least in the last couple of years. But a lot of things could change. A lot of things could change. I'm taking the uh, the Hornets in that one, though. This next game, though, 
Really exciting one. We've got number 25, Bemidji State. The Beavers are at number 13, Minnesota State Mankato, again, playing against the Mavericks. Big time NSIC matchup. You look at the history of this matchup. We'll kind of look at the preview of the game here as well. And Mankato took this one last year, 27 20, so 4, 24, excuse me. So a very narrow margin of victory. But the Mavericks have actually won the last four. In this matchup, they've won the last four, and that uh, that spans, let's see here, if I find the, uh, yep, here we go. For, so from 2018 onward, Bemidji State has not beaten Mankato, and three of those four games have actually been in Bemidji, been at home. Something definitely worth noting, the Beavers, the, the Mavericks have just had the Beavers number, I suppose. But, looking at this one. Bemidji in week zero, they took an overtime thriller at home versus Michigan Tech on Thursday. A, a semi-sloppy performance from the Bemidji State offense. We knew that Michigan Tech defense was going to be flying around. Now, they did just let up. It was four overtimes, but they let up like 50 points against South Dakota Mines tonight. So I, I'm not really sure what to make of that Michigan Tech game right now for the Beavers. I think we're a little, still a little bit too close to see how everything shakes out. Uh, Bemidji's offense is definitely going to have to take a step up, though. When you look at the box score from that game against Michigan Tech, Sam McGath is uh, starting under center right now for the Beavers. He was 20 for 36 with 195 and two tuds, which is not a terrible stat line, but you watch the game and it just didn't feel like Bemidji had that same explosive firepower as they did maybe a year ago with Brandon All under center. And I'm not going to say you'll be able to replicate that right away. Obviously, there's some other pieces and they got to get some things figured out on the receiving end uh, when it comes to their offense. But it just feels like that explosive, kind of that X factor for the Beavers offense right now is not exactly there. And uh, if you want to beat Mankato, they are, especially on the road at Mankato, you're going to have to do a lot better than that offensively. I think that's kind of the biggest takeaway for me. Looking at the Mavericks, though, their home, not home opener, but their opener to the season this year down in Northwest Missouri State, that game was ridiculous. And they look really good. They, they just look really Really solid right now. They beat them 36-22 on the road. That was the 12th consecutive season. The Mavericks have won their season opener. And, um, you know, it, it's it's a really good start for them. I don't really know what else to uh, what else to say for you. Hayden uh, Ecker now, the quarterback, is a senior. He's got some good game experience under his belt and some big-time uh, big games, big-time moments. So he's got a little bit more poise maybe than we're used to. The defensive line and defensive kind of that front seven for uh, Mankato really stepped up, and they're going to win against Northwest. I, I feel like they're going to have a not an easy time. I feel like they're going to be able, though, to shut down and minimize the Bemidji offense. I think I would take Mankato by like 10 points in this one, especially at home. And if Bemidji can't slow him down, I don't think Bemidji's offense can keep up. I would probably take Mankato by two, maybe even three scores at home. But again, two nationally ranked opponents, you would like to imagine the score does not get that out of hand. Finally, let's go to the one that we will talk about right after this piece with uh, Tristan X-Line. Number 21, UTPB at CSU Pueblo, who is currently receiving votes in the national poll. I would bet a lot that after this week, they're going to be in that top 25. Uh, but Texas Permian Basin, coming off a Lone Star Conference Championship last year, they beat the brakes off of Western New Mexico last week, 41-3 to at home. And CSU Pueblo... They did the same thing to South Dakota Mines on the road, 35-6 to over a hard rocker team that we're finding out might have actually not been that bad. CSU Pueblo might just be very good at football. When you look at the box score for this one, and I'm going to talk about it with Tristan here shortly, but what you'll notice is that through the air, this CSU Pueblo team is getting things done, and they've got a receiving core that uh, is shaping up to potentially be one of the most dangerous in the RMAC. Looking at the box score from their last outing, Devin Larson under center at quarterback for Pueblo, 30 for 45, 500 yards and five touchdowns with no interceptions. Then you go to the receivers. Reggie Retzlaff is a name that we've been familiar with. Anyone who knows our back or D2 football probably knows of him. But then about how about Taylor Toshes? I hopefully I'm saying that one correctly. 11 catches of his own for 151 in the tud. Reggie had 11 for 241 in three tuds. You're talking about two wide receivers that combined for 400 yards and four touchdowns. That is almost unheard of. So we'll talk about that with Tristan CL. UTPB thinks they can match up against that because UTPB, we know their offense is going to come out and play ball. 
They did it all last year. feels like they're picking up right where they left off in 2024. We know they can keep up when it comes to a shootout. Can their defense keep them in the game? That's the question mark, especially because they're going on the road. This is at CSU Pueblo. Just judging off week one performances and what we know about each of these squads, I'm giving Pueblo like a a five, six point advantage here, probably a one score type advantage. I would take the Thunderwolves here, especially at home. The home opener, red out game there for the Thunderwolves. Feels like that's going to be a really, really solid environment. Other game notes, though. Um, Looking through the facts here. Trying to think if we got anything uh, anything big. The first matchup in program history between these two squads, which is pretty neat. But otherwise, I mean, that those are kind of the big notes, at least what I'm expecting from both these squads. That kind of wraps up my D2 preview for this week. Let's finish off the episode, go to our last guest conversation with Tristan from that UTPB squad. Joining the show tonight, this man took home the Lone Star Conference Defensive Player of the Week honors after a big-time performance against Western New Mexico, the linebacker out of UTPB, Tristan X-Line. What's up, man? What's up? How's it going? Dude, great. Better now that we got you on here. You're all polo tonight, too, for the show? Just for the show? I had to throw it on, yeah. I love it. I love it. American flag in the background. I love to hear it. But uh, what a start to 2024 for you guys, but also, I guess, personally, for you, man, what was, uh, you know, everything was clicking on Saturday. Had to have been, huh? Yeah, it was pretty pretty good to finally play someone else other than your own team. But um, I thought we did a pretty good job. You know, it's been a long off season, and it was nice to finally put on the pads and have a, have a day. Hit somebody in a different colored uniform, maybe? Yes, sir. And, exactly. uh, you know, when it comes to – obviously, we'll talk about your performance uh, quite a bit because you had a big-time game, kind of come onto the scene and, and become a big player for this uh, defense on that side of the ball. What excites you about this group, though, man? It feels like there's obviously a lot more than just you going out there. You're doing your 111th. You're doing it damn well, but you're doing your 111th. Uh, what excites you about this group defensively moving forward? I think our uh, our D-line is very, very dominant part of our team. Um I would even go as far as say they're they're probably our best position group on our team right now. They they did a hell of a job on uh, Saturday, so I'm really excited. And I think I think they're not done yet either. And then in the back end, our DBs are very very talented. So our defense as a whole is really really exciting. I don't think um, we've even really scratched the surface of how good we can be. And to be honest, I I wouldn't even expected myself to get player of the game. I would have gave it to any of our other D linemen. So, hey, yeah, well exciting. said, and that's exactly what you're supposed to say, brother. But uh, you're in that one. Um, did they have you on a quarterback spy this weekend or what, man? I feel like you were just back there all the time. Yeah, yeah, we uh we didn't call too much. I was in I was in a quarterback spy for for a majority of it. So yeah. Do you like getting those? I feel like those are pretty fun assignments typically to get. I mean, usually what comes with that, though, is a really athletic kind of elusive quarterback. It's why you usually pull that out of the, the bag of tricks there. But is that a fun assignment for you? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm new to it a little bit. I'm used to being in coverage a little bit more. But okay, yeah, pretty nice. I like it. Now, last year with you guys, the offense was obviously a huge selling point, right? I mean, when you go and you average over 42 points per game, that's going to be a lot of what people talk about. It's a flashy part of the game. But when you hold opponents to less than 20 in that same statistic defensively, maybe we ought to talk more about what's happening on the other side of the ball. It feels like there's a really good balance down there. You guys give yourself good competitive uh, practices in preseason. Yeah, yeah. Our offense is is really good as well. It's hard not to talk about them as well. Our our quarterback, obviously Dylan Graham, does a great job, puts the ball where it needs to go. And then like uh like our coach always talks about, our receivers are best in D two. They they go oh, yeah. they do a good job of going up and getting the ball. So offense is really exciting to watch as well. And that quarterback, correct me if I'm wrong, he's been there for quite a long time, but just hasn't maybe broken through and earned that title of the job. Is am I correct in saying that? Yes, sir. He um I believe he started a couple years ago before Coach McCullough came in, yep. and uh, he brought his own quarterback with him. So he he decided to be a, a good teammate and sat, uh, let Kenny start last year, and then his time's finally here, and he, he's doing a hell of a job. That takes a lot, dude. That takes a lot. A new coach comes in, like you said, kind of brings his guy with him and Kenny, and we've had uh, Hermster on the pod here pretty recently, actually, especially talking about that his new position there and that coaching staff. 
that takes a lot for somebody to, to say that. And I'm, I'm comfortable with, with maybe not being the guy, but still trying to help my team win. And then, you know, seeing the fruits of that a year or so later, and now being able to step into that role once again and be the starter. What have you seen from him? I know it's been, you know, still pretty early, a lot of games to be played yet, but what have you seen from him composure wise and leadership wise out there? Well, he's actually, uh, start off. He's my locker, my locker buddy. Okay. So, I like it. Okay. Yeah. So I get to be around him a lot. He's a, he's a very, very good person. First of all, he, uh, he always puts the team first. He's always, you'll always see him in the facility. First one in first one out. Uh, he's, he's everything you want out of a quarterback does his job. And, uh, he's, he's, he is a great leader. Now you guys last year, 24 takeaways on the season and, I think the expression that is really good is like in football, you can kind of make your own luck. Obviously, when you get certain interceptions or fumble recoveries, things of that nature, a lot of it is just being at the right place at the right time. But damn it, defensively, you have to rally to the ball to be constantly doing that. Is that something that has been emphasized a lot going into this year? Something you guys talk about and focus on? Or is it, uh, you know, rally to the ball, take care of what you take care of, everything else kind of handle itself? Yeah, obviously, uh, turnovers are a big, big thing, big part of college football and football in general. So, we're always talking about the turnover battle, and now whoever wins the turnover battle is usually going to win the game. So, yeah, we put a big emphasis on that in practice, and uh, and everything we do, we we practice getting the ball out, uh, tips and overthrows, stuff like that, pretty much every day. Totally, I know we had a we used to have a DC who would run around practice, and you know, middle of a random drill or something, whistle would blow, and sudden change, and then ones ones on ones, right, line up make it happen, got to, you know, anticipate for game day. Also, just to break up sometimes the monotony that is uh, camp or practice. When you get going, you get in some of those rhythms. Sometimes to shake guys out of that is good. But uh, talking about that defense, guys definitely are going to be tested this week, man. Going over to Pueblo to play against an offense that had, I mean, just an explosion last week when it came to putting up points on the board and some big stat lines across, uh, especially their passing offense, but just in general. What can you tell me about their offense that you've seen so far you got to prep for? Um. Honestly, I would say that they are pretty similar to our offense. They like to try to get the ball to their pit, uh, their playmakers. They um, they like to run up tempo a lot. They have a, a couple good players. Number four, their running backs pretty talented. Um, but I think as long as as long as we stop the run and do our job, you know, we'll put ourselves in a pretty good position. Good answer. Hey, good answer. Um, but. Uh... Talking about that up tempo a little bit, and it is something we've seen from them. What does that change on your guys' end? As again, as much as you can say, I don't need to. I don't need the whole play-by-play breakdown. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going Connor Stallions on your ass. Um, anything of that nature. But what does that change for you guys? And how do you adapt to a team that likes to push the tempo like that? Yeah, obviously, uh, you got to prep for that. So, uh, practice. We we've been practicing uh, tempo a lot lately, and so. Um, not just lining up to the ball, but uh, also know what you're supposed to do. You know, when when teams are going up tempo a lot, it's really important to just stick with the call. But um, also just everyone doing their job at the same time is, is really important. No, I hear that. I hear that, man. First ever meeting between these two teams. You guys know that? I did not. There you go. So, I mean, it begs the question. You got to start this thing off on the right foot, right? Sure kind of do. a neat ordeal. I don't know many people that get to have like the first ever meeting between two squads, especially when both of them are at a point in their their program's history where they're both really damn good. So that that's kind of an exciting just a, a footnote there for you. Uh, they're on an eight game win streak right now, which of course I'm sure you guys aren't talking about that, but you know they got a lot of momentum coming into this this new year. Big part of that, the receiver duo over there, uh, Red Slaff and Dojas, who combined for almost 400 yards and four touchdowns last week. As a guy you talked about earlier, used to, you're used to being in coverage a lot, uh, going out there and defending some of those playmakers. Not just them in particular, but you know you have guys like that on the outside coming in with a lot of momentum. Do you do anything early to kind of get them out of rhythm or, or kind of set the tone early on to let them know that it's going to be kind of a long day, long night? Yeah, um... Like I said earlier, it's really important that we stop the run early, try to get them out of that tempo as early as possible. But, um, yeah, we just we have a lot of faith in our DBs this week. Obviously, they have a, have a couple pretty good receivers, so it's important that they have a great game. But uh, this whole staff, all of our players, we all have a lot of faith in our DBs that they're going to do our uh, their job and uh, just go play. Hell, yeah. I always think of uh... – that uh, it, what is it, the the redeem team that that documentary right and Kobe and he just goes runs through Paul Gasol's face, 
Right, just like that that tone setting type of. You just need someone to go out there and set the tone. Feels like you're kind of the guy for this defense that would go out and do something like that, yeah? Yeah, I do my best. <laughs> Night game, though, at the base of the Rocky Mountains, brother. Doesn't get much better than that, huh? Are you excited to play out there? It's obviously your first time playing in that stadium. Yeah, yeah. We we obviously traveled to uh, Colorado last year. It was a little yep. bit higher. So, uh just doing, trying to do our best to get acclimated to that again and so that we can play our best brand of ball. Hell yeah, man. Well, you know, uh, I, for one, will definitely be following along. Excited to see what you and the boys do defensively, but overall, ex- uh, ex- really expecting to be a back-and-forth kind of slugfest out there. But thank you for joining me, Tristan. I appreciate you, man. Have a good rest of your night. Yes, sir. Thank you for your time. See ya.